Okay. Okay, uh, let's start. Let's begin with prayer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for another evening, uh, another opportunity to gather and to think and reflect on uh, what you would have us know and understand about uh, living in a way that pleases you, uh, making decisions that are uh, glorifying to you and that ultimately are part of the building of your kingdom here. Uh, we ask that you would uh, give us uh, understanding, enlighten our hearts and our minds that we might be able to make sense of your word in a way that uh, mutually uh, edifies uh, us and also uh, glorifies you. So we just would ask you would meet with us this evening and we would pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, uh, so we're looking. We've been looking at uh, uh, Revelation uh, and the idea of special versus general, and then general. We do, we subdivided that general down a little bit to ex existential revelation to sort of just give it a little bit more fine uh, fine uh, tuning. Uh, and <clears throat> we talked last time about uh, the. Uh, external aspects of uh, existential revelation so that God uh, actually does speak to us uh, in uh, authoritative ways through uh, structures that He creates. For example, He speaks to us through church councils, through creeds and confessions, uh, and those are ways He uh, communicates uh, his uh, will as they encapsulate the essence of uh, special revelation which is the in the Bible and uh, and so uh, that's an important dimension of understanding how God continues to uh, reveal himself to us they are subordinate to special revelation in that uh, special revelation has a sort of absolute quality to it uh, but nonetheless general or existential revelation has a role to play, a valid role to play. And uh, that existential revelation is also uh, has an internal dimension to it, an internal dimension to it. And that is oftentimes what we refer to when we talk about illumination or uh, the idea of uh, leading, the leading of the Holy Spirit, the inward leading of the Holy Spirit or the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and so we want to look at that briefly, if we can, what that actually means. Uh, because, again, we remember we said that making a decision, uh, a, a, a proper decision, is a coordination between uh, the norm or the, the authoritative voice of God, uh, the voice of God as it's revealed through the concrete situation and environment we find ourselves, and then also as he speaks to us individually in that in that context and so as we talk about the his speech to us inwardly and internally that's the speech we refer to here as the illuminating work of the spirit or the leading of the spirit and what saves or, or what protects us from uh, from being uh, from going in a wrong direction with that is the balance that has meant to happen between the Word of God, the authoritative Word of God, and looking at that in, in the context of other people and things and situations. So the, the inward leading or illuminating work of the Spirit isn't in isolation from those other two, and that keeps us from, from error, from uh, uh, finding a false justification for a decision based on some internal prompting of the spirit that that can be dangerous but it's not dangerous as long as it's, it's seen interrelatedly to the other two perspectives and that's why it's important to see all three of them uh, together uh, so when we talk about the illumination of the Holy Spirit we talk about that uh, we're talking about the gift of understanding that God gives to us uh, and in, in some ways, he even does that to non-believers, but specifically for us, we'll look at right now, but, and we'll look at that next. But uh, So when the Holy Spirit illumines a person's mind, uh, he gives us the ability uh, or knowledge that we lacked previously. Um, and so it uh, moves from a purely cognitive sort of dimension to 
something that's not completely cognitive, it's not informational, so to speak, uh, as much. And one of the greatest examples of that you can see in Matthew 16, where Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? And Peter didn't say, well, I read it in the Old Testament. He said, uh, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but my, by my Father in heaven. And so uh, Peter had all the corroborating information he needed from Jesus. He'd been with him, he'd walked with him, he'd seen him do all these things. Uh, but you know that lots of people walked with Jesus, saw what he did, and did not have a clue. But Peter said, you are the Son of God, the Christ. And he said, blessed are you, because my Father in heaven revealed that to you. So the simple observation did, would not necessarily have led Peter to the right conclusion about who Jesus was. In fact, people came to the wrong conclusions about who Jesus was. Uh, seeing all the same phenomena that Peter saw, they still didn't see him for what he really was. And, and in fact, Peter, you recall in, uh, in Mark chapter 8, where that same story is told, uh, you have a, an interesting sort of transition in the Gospel of Mark with the healing of the blind man. And you remember when Jesus went to heal the blind man, he put some water in one his eyes, and the guy he says, so what do you see? And what did he say he saw? Do you remember? Trees walking. He said, I see trees walking like men. Well, they weren't trees. So then what does Jesus do? He does it again. Right? So it's a two-stage healing. He does it again, and then he goes, oh, thou art the Son of God. And he says, uh, and so there's a reason for that pivotal picture in Mark 8, which is the hinge of the gospel, is that from that point, up to that point, even the disciples, when they saw Jesus, they saw him as a tree walking like a man. But from Mark 8 and on, he revealed to them who he really was. Remember? Because he told, he told Peter, I've come to die. What did Peter say? Don't talk like that. Yeah, he said, you know, you're crazy. You know, and what did Jesus say? Get thee behind me, Satan. So, so the revelation of himself was, a, was something phased, and Peter all of a sudden sees him for who he really is. And the, when he initially sees him as that way, he doesn't like it because Jesus said, okay, yeah, I'm, I am who you say I am now, but oh, by the way, I'm going to have to go to Jerusalem and die. And Peter goes like, no, 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 that's not what we're going to do. We're going to Jerusalem. We're going to start a big church. We're going to have a big steeple. We're going to have thousands of people coming. It's just going to be a glorious opportunity. And Jesus says, get thee behind me, Satan, because that would be Satan's path, right? So when Jesus met Satan in, in, in the period of temptation, what did Satan offer him? All the kingdoms of the world. I mean, he wanted to give him everything, but he did not want him to go to the cross. <laughs> so anyway... That's uh, what you have here is the illuminating work of the Spirit for Peter. He saw Jesus, and it wasn't because he had new facts. It was because the Spirit revealed it to him. Uh, so, for who among men knows the thoughts of a man uh, except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but of the Spirit of who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. Given us. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Again, Paul is alluding there. Uh, that uh, that you can apprehend the same facts, we can see the same facts, but not grasp the facts in the right way. And so, uh, so what we need is an additional work of the Spirit to show us what's really going on, because otherwise all we see uh, are facts that don't seem to come to any true conclusion. And so, uh, because we're limited, we're finite, and of course we're sinful, uh, but the Holy Spirit works within believers uh, to give us a, an understanding of the gospel and its truth. And that's a supernatural insight into the truth. Uh, and so, at the very least, all believers uh, have a belief and trust in Jesus as Savior that comes through or directly from the Holy Spirit. And so, we should not be surprised if people don't grasp the, grasp the true significance of who Jesus is, because that's something that is the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit gives us that capacity. It illumines us, illumines our ability to grasp the truth about Jesus. Uh, otherwise, he's just an interesting character from history.
Paul said in Philippians 1, it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ to believe on Him. It's interesting that expression to be granted is to literally to be given freely or freely given. And so what's, what's Paul actually telling us there? That the faith that we have in Christ was actually a faith given to us, not something we achieve somehow through. That's why, you know, people you ask yourself the question, you know, why am I in church and my brother isn't? Why am I a Christian and my parents aren't? Or why am I a Christian and my husband isn't or my, my wife isn't? And things like that. And you start to actually start thinking, well, maybe it's because I'm just able to put the pieces together and they're not. I'm a little smarter than they are. Maybe I'm a little more clever than they are. Maybe I'm more sensitive than they are. And in actual fact, if it's any of those things, then you're the only reason you're there. But it's really not those things. It's been granted to you freely. So when Paul says, by grace you're safe through faith, not of works, it refers to what? The faith. <laughs> okay, so the gift was the faith itself. So that's exactly what we're talking about here. God gives that gift. The illuminating work of the Spirit is the gift He gives to see things as they really are and to see Jesus as He really is. So the Bible also... Yeah? Um, what do you say to a non-believer who says, um, then how can I understand any of Christian faith if it's all by God's work? So he says, you know, I well, they can't. And, but he says, how do I understand? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, they can't really understand it. That, by that, they mean grasp its significance. Yes. There's all kinds of information you can gather and gain about the Christian faith, about the church, about what Christians believe, the things they do, the rituals they perform. You can, anyone can know those things, but they don't see them in their true significance. They don't see the life-giving, if you will, dimension of what that is. It's just information. It's just facts. But what do you say to someone who says, I want to know, but you're telling me I can't. I want to know, but I can't. So well, you don't tell people they can't. I'm talking to you right now. You're a Christian. Okay? We're Christians here. But I, would, Christian, I would not be talking to a Christian about, you'll never get this because you don't have the Holy Spirit. I wouldn't say that. Of course I wouldn't. I would simply tell them the truth. I know they will not grasp the significance of it apart from the work of the Holy Spirit, but I don't tell them that. They wouldn't understand anyway. Paul says the things of the Spirit are known by the power of the Spirit. The things of the flesh are known by the, the power of the flesh. So you're operating with people who don't see the world the right way, but you don't tell them that right off the bat. You say, you just tell them the truth about Jesus. That's what you do. And then let the Spirit of God do what it does or doesn't do. But we now, as Christians, as we analyze what this all means, and we read the New Testament, we go, oh, so that's why I actually came to faith in Christ. Because the Holy Spirit convicted me that the gift of faith came from God. I didn't conjure it up on my own. Oh, so that's what happened. But how do you preach then Mark 8? <laughs> okay, I understand, but how do you... Okay, but there's a non-Christian in the church, and how do you preach Mark 8 or Matthew 16? I preach them all the same way. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't follow what you mean. Well, but you have to tell them that unless God gives you, you will not. Well, yeah, well, if you're saying, I mean, oh, I'm not sure I follow you. But if people are sitting in the church that aren't Christians, I don't know. They could all be not Christians for all I know. Hmm. In fact, I would assume they are. Martin Lloyd Jones once said the biggest mistake a pastor can make is think that more than 50 percent of his congregation is saved. Did he change his message because of that? No. You just preach the text, preach the gospel, preach the Bible. And I assume most of the people sitting in my church probably don't know Jesus. I really do. But that doesn't change what I say. We just say it because the gospel, we haven't gotten there yet, but the Bible has power. The gospel is the power of God into salvation. I preach the message. I preach the truth. Let the Holy Spirit do what it wants to do in the lives of those people. Do I avoid passages like this because they suggest the fact that I only believe because the Holy Spirit makes it possible? No, of course I say it. It's exactly what I say. Let the chips fall where they may. I mean, I'm not worried about that. But I don't go meet up with a non-Christian at a coffee shop and go, no, by the way, I'm going to tell you all this stuff about Jesus, but oh, by the way, you'll never understand it unless you get the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the argument gets turned the other way around. They are some of them are clever enough, and they say, "Right, you're telling me these truths, but actually, I know that it's by the gift of God. I don't have the gift. 
I won't believe this. That's fine. Yeah, that's that's that's, that's cool with me. Buy another cup of coffee. And this one's on you. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't have a problem with that at all. Uh, I mean, because this is supernatural stuff we're talking about here, right? Isn't it? But they, they make it an excuse. That's okay. To... Do you care? I don't care if they make that an excuse. An unbeliever will come up with a million excuses. In fact, they're doing it all the time, right? I mean, we do believe that if we're Calvinists. They are doing that all the time. They're creating idols every day, every minute of every day. They're manufacturing another belief system for themselves to get through the day or get through their lives or whatever it might be. I don't care about that. All I know is the truth has power. And I rely on the Spirit to make that truth work in the life of a person. Whether it does or doesn't, it's not my problem. It's God's problem, ultimately. It's His Spirit that lives life, not me. So actually, you you're not you're saying that you're not revealing this to non-Christians, but you're doing it in a clever way. So in a church, you will. I am not clever. <laughs> no one's ever accused me of being clever. <laughs> Let's talk uh, personally. No, I'm not. I'll meet you. I'm not clever. I'm not story. that smart. <laughs> I really am not. I really am not. But but clearly, when you're talking to a non-Christian, you don't talk about the details of how you live the Christian life. They don't, they're not Christians. I mean, so what are you talking about, okay? You talk about other things. You're trying to talk about the gospel. That's what you're trying to talk about. Because it is the power of God into salvation, not my clever speech. I, I go back to Paul. Not very many smart people come to Jesus. They just don't. Not many wise. No. The weak things of the world, the broken people come to Jesus. I know that. So why would I presume otherwise? It's the power of God. It's supernatural. It's the Holy Spirit we're talking about here. And I'm talking to you right now. I'm talking to a Christian right now. I'm trying to help you understand the dynamic of your own life as you make decisions before God that are glorifying to Him or not. And recognizing that one of the ways He works in the life of a believer is through the power of the illuminating Spirit of God. Now, I wouldn't be teaching this class to a bunch of non-Christians. They wouldn't even know what I was talking about. But I'm talking to Christians, and you should know what I'm talking about. This is the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit. And, <clears throat> and in fact, apart from the Spirit doing this in your life, then it's probably a fraud. If this isn't of the Spirit, it's the fraud. So that's the point we're making here, is when we make decisions before God, we rely upon His Word... He's revealing Himself through people and circumstances and situations, and is revealing Himself to me internally by His Spirit, illuminating me, giving me a sense of reality, a sense of truth, a prompting of His Spirit that coordinates with His Word. Right? That's what we mean. That's why it's important to get all these things in balance. If we don't, we take one thing out of balance, then it throws the whole thing off. It throws everything off. You've got to keep it together. It's all interrelated. All right? So this is what the Holy Spirit does. So, before we digress further. In other words, God implants in every human being, even in unbelievers, a basic knowledge of His law. God even does this with non-Christians. Now, they're never going to say that, but this is what we're told. Regardless of your exposure to general revelation, we all instinctively know that certain things are right and wrong. Why? Why do people instinctively know certain things are right and wrong? Aren't you glad that people do instinctively know things are right and wrong? Wouldn't you rather live in a world like that than a world where nobody instinctively knew right and wrong? Well, that's right. That's part of God's common grace because He's wired the universe this way. Thank goodness He's wired the universe this way. Otherwise, we're back with Hobbes' state of war, where every day you walk out the door, you better have a gun in your hand or a knife because somebody's going to try to kill you or take what you have. So the fact is that people stop at red lights, they don't grab your purse, they don't run you down in their cars, they don't do all these kinds. You're going like, why do they do that? Well, it's part of God's common grace. He's wired people to know instinctively that some things really you just don't do. All right, You just don't do that. They don't do it because they want to glorify God, but that somehow the law is written on their hearts and their consciences bear witness to that. Now, the, the problem with cultures is that they become more and more decadent 
And as they become more and more decadent, they, uh, in effect, create these insulating uh, forces that numb the conscience, that dull the conscience, so that, that all of a sudden a generation begins to arise that seems less sensitive intuitively to things that would otherwise they would know were wrong or not right to do. And so that's part of the sort of, if you will, the sort of demonic work within human cultures is to sort of create a distorting influence on the conscience. And that's what Paul talks about in Romans 1, that we harden ourselves to the work that God is doing in the conscience of people to know the difference between right and wrong. So we begin to harden ourselves, numb ourselves. We become uh, we become insensitive to things that would normally would be the marks of God's making us in His image. And this is a uh, this is typical of what happens in cu- in the in culture. So that when Paul says in Romans one, not only do people do bad things, they encourage other people to do them. You know, it's not enough for me to engage in an activity that's not pleasing to God. I need comrades to go along with me. Because if I can get 50 people who do the same thing I do, it's a lot less difficult to do the things that I do. So cultures build up this whole, uh, this sort of an army of abusers of conscience to where everybody thinks now it's okay to do this or, or whatever it might be. And so the conscience can be easily, if you will, singed or, or repressed or, or, or uh, broken down and become ineffectual from what it was really meant to be. Uh, beyond all that, the Holy Spirit uh, not, only, uh, not only illuminates, but the Holy Spirit is described as inwardly leading, inwardly leading. Uh, so as, a, as opposed to illumination, which is mostly cognitive, inward leading tends to be more emotive and intuitive. It's one of the most common ways in which the Holy Spirit works within individuals to real, reveal the truth of God's character. Uh, you see that uh, displayed in things like the individual conscience, uh, also these uh, uh, individ- indescribable feelings that God would have us take a particular course of action. Uh, in other words, it's hard to kind of specifically describe it or articulate it, but it's there and you're not sure what it is. Paul referred to that leading in Philippians 2 and he wrote, It is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. So <clears throat> he's not here, you, you notice he's not talking about what it is you believe or know, but rather what you will or desire. Notice what it says. He says, It's God who works in you to will and to act according to His good purpose. And so uh, it's a form, uh, it's, a, it's a means whereby by God reveals to us in working through us impressions about God's character, an impression about God's character. Uh, and that's true of all existential forms of revelation because it reveals His character. It's a binding standard that somehow convinces us that we must conform to His will, conform to His character if we are to be pleasing to Him. So we've looked at all three of those categories of revelation and we've seen how all of God's revelation provides us with norms that reveal the character of God. So now the important thing is to see the unity of those three categories of revealed norms. We need to see the unity of these things. So general, special, and existential revelation are all intimately related to one another. All reveal the same God and all reveal the same standard and are all binding and authoritative. So any one of them seen properly always connects itself to the other two and always will bring you to the same conclusion. It will always bring you to the same conclusion. You're not going to have conclusion existentially different from the conclusion you find by looking at the world as made by God and under His control given the various situations and facts that present themselves to us. Nor are you going to see anything from the existential perspective properly that's going to conflict with the authoritative, normative perspective of God. They're going to lead you to the same place, but what you have is an enriched perspective on things. So what does that mean as we try to make a biblical decision? Remember what decision making is. It involves the application of God's Word to a particular situation by a person. 
So if I say, what's the definition of ethics? You know what it is. The application of God's Word to a particular situation uh, <clears throat> by a person. And, uh, and that covers all three of the angles, doesn't it? God's Word, situation, persons. Those three, all three of those. And so in light of that model, the unity of God's general, special, and existential revelation indicates that we should inform all ethical judgment by all the revelation available to us. That's very important. So when someone presents a problem, you don't just go, well, what does the Bible say? You want to go, I need to know more about the problem. Right? That's the situation. I need to know more about it. I may not have sufficient facts relative to the question. So I need to know more about it. I don't just go, you don't, you don't put every issue in the same little box and just assume all the facts are always the same. You go, well, let's see, what are the facts in this situation? How do they really you know, work? And then I start looking at that in relationship to God's sovereignty, His control, His power. I look at that in terms of what He's revealed about Himself and about His will. And I start looking at the way that revelation of Himself to me individually in my own life uh, in terms of how I understand the world and how I'm meant to bring the world into submission to God's authority. All of those things are brought into bear when you're making a biblical and ethical decision. And so Christian ethics isn't just telling people what's right and wrong. It's not simply saying bad, good. It is bad or good, but there's more complicated than that. It's more complicated than that. So general and existential revelation don't give us new information about God's character that isn't contained in Scripture. It simply confirms what's contained in Scripture. It enlarges on it. It amplifies it, if you will, what's contained in Scripture. But we understand what Scripture teaches us more clearly when we compare it to the rest of God's revelation. That's why Van Til could say, the more I understand God's world, the better I understand God. Why? Well, he made the world. <laughs> it bears his fingerprints, okay? So if I disregard what he's made, I'm, I'm ignoring the fingerprints of God on the world. And he said, this is one of the ways I want to teach you. This is one of the ways I want to reveal myself to you. So Christians should be enthusiastic scientists. They should be enthusiastic artists, enthusiastic writers, enthusiastic poets. They shouldn't be, you know, oh, stay away from that the world. It's really a bad place. No, you don't look at the world that way at all. Okay. You see what the world can become, but you see what it was made to be. And that's a different reality altogether. So without general revelation, look, <clears throat> if you didn't know how to read, you couldn't use the Bible. Yeah, every, time I taught, every time I've ever taught New Testament Greek, the best students all had the best grasp of language. If you don't know what a preposition is in your own language, you'll never know what it is in Greek. Right? You'll never know. So, if a person understands their own language well, they know what an infinitive, a split infinitive is, they know what all these things are, then they get to the New Testament and they go, Oh! This makes Greek easy! But if they're bad grammarians in their own language, Greek is impossible! Well, what does that tell you? What is it? The more books you read, whether it's Shakespeare or Tolstoy, the better you'll understand the Bible. Because it's language. It's rich language. And the richer your vocabulary, the richer your conceptual vocabulary, the richer your understanding of the way words fit together and hang together and work together, the better and the richer your understanding of the Bible's going to be. There's a great little book, Why Johnny Can't Preach. You ever read that? Why Johnny Can't Preach? You've heard of it. Well, you really should read it. Why Johnny Can't Preach. And you know why Johnny Can't Preach? This is the conclusion of the book. So I'm saving you six ninety five. He can't read. That's right. He can't read. Ask the average seminary student, you know, how many books have you read that weren't Bible focused? Oh, I don't have time for that. I'm too busy reading the Bible. You'll never understand the Bible unless you read other books. Your sermons will stink. <laughs> Trust me, I've graded them. Johnny can't preach because Johnny can't read. <laughs> you know, the, in the old days, at Princeton Seminary in the old days, 
And it's the same thing at Westminster Seminary. When I went to Westminster Seminary, you got no credit for Greek or Hebrew. No credit. And it really upset students. I mean, I'm not getting any credit for this Greek and this Hebrew. No, no credit for Greek and Hebrew. Why? Because at Old Princeton, it was assumed you'd already studied Latin, Greek, and Hebrew before you got to seminary. It was part of a liberal arts education. Everybody knew Greek. Didn't you know that? They all read Plato in Greek. Didn't you know that? It's true. Yeah. They'd all read, all read Sophocles. They knew all that stuff. Seminary was like the finishing touches. Not the whole deal. So, <clears throat> The, the, without general revelation in books and in language and art and all these things, poetry, you read all these things, it enriches your appreciation of the things God has made and the wonderful way in which those images can be captured in language. And it's rich and fulfilling. It's wonderful. Then you read the Bible and go, wow! You know, it, it, it's... a. Uh, uh, the guy, Harold Bloom at Yale, who's one of the main sort of Shakespeare scholars in the world, he wrote a wonderful book, which basically, he basically articulates that the greatest literature in Western civilization could never have been written if there had been no Bible. Shakespeare is nothing but the Bible. Have you ever noticed that? The plots that he uses in his plays, he takes them right out of the Bible. It's amazing. Because the Bible talks about human experiences, deception and treachery, lying, deceit, and all these kinds of things. And so Shakespeare comes along and goes, I'm going to write a play like that. Oh, wow. And so I read Shakespeare and I go, wow. And then I read the Bible and go, wow. So that, that really is right in the Bible, isn't it? Those images come right out of the Bible. It's called general revelation. I don't know why we ignore it. We do to our detriment. So why Johnny can't preach? Because Johnny can't read. There was a book written a long time ago called Why Johnny Can't Write. Same thing, Johnny Can't Read. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, so we wouldn't even have access to the special revelation of Scripture unless we'd taken access to general revelation. Thank goodness my mama taught me how to read. It sure made reading the Bible a lot easier. <laughs> so, I, uh, of course, the illumination of the Holy Spirit, existential revelation is critical to comprehending the message of Scripture. The message of Scripture. So using all forms of God's revelation provides great insight as we apply Scripture to life. So uh, I think I said yesterday that Aristotle said, why do you read? Because nobody can live long enough. In other words, you can vicariously accelerate your understanding of the world and human experience by reading through the experiences of other people. I can't do it all by myself because I don't live long enough. But I can read this and I can read that and all of a sudden those become part of me. They become part of my understanding of things. And so my, my, my understanding of the world accelerates incredibly when I do that. Uh, and so it makes it possible to apply scripture in ways that we would otherwise perhaps have more difficulty doing. Okay, so now we want to look at the uh, attributes of scripture. The attributes of scripture, that is the that is the normative perspective, the authoritative word, the scriptures themselves. And we want to look at first then here. Uh, we're going to go pretty fast through some of this stuff because we, we don't have enough time. But anyway, uh, so the attributes of scripture. And so these are the standards we use for ethical decisions. <clears throat> And if we're going to talk about the Scripture, we need to understand uh, uh, something about uh, Scripture in terms of its uh, divine authorship, its power, and its authority, and then its, uh, its attributes of necessity and sufficiency, its, its attribute of sufficiency, necessity and uh, sufficiency, clarity, necessity, and sufficiency. And so, when we talk about the Bible being our authority for ethics, uh, our authority for making ethical decisions, uh, it helps if we know, or we at least are somewhat convinced by the fact, that it's a divinely authored book. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, if it's not just a, a book, the book of men, but the, a book uh, of God, that God used men to do it, but they worked under his authority, his control, uh, because of his power, and therefore what they wrote, or what they said, uh, was what God wanted us to hear and wanted us to know and understand.
And so its authority is primarily because of its divine authorship and its power comes from that. Uh, so uh, Christians, we, we approach the subject of ethics. Uh, we're not merely interested in uh, figuring out what's a good thing or a bad thing. I mean, we want to know, but that's not what we're all we're interested in. We're uh, interested in applying that knowledge by acting, thinking, and feeling in ways that are morally praiseworthy. Did you notice what I just said? Applying knowledge so that we're acting, thinking, and feeling <laughs> the way we are supposed to, that is, in a way that brings praise and honor to God. So most of us think of Christian ethics as acting, right? Just doing something, the right thing, not the wrong thing. But that isn't all it's about. It's about acting, but it's about thinking. It's about feeling. It's all of those things. So uh, if all you do is teach your children how to act like righteous people, you've created a Pharisee in your house. And you're back to the prodigal son, all right? So you, you, all you're doing is you're creating elder brothers. You want an elder brother in your house? Who's just waiting for you to die and get his inheritance? I mean, you want an elder brother in your family? I don't think I want any elder brothers in my family. Okay, But that's all you'll get if ethics is just acting. If it's just doing things. Performing. Up to expectations. Whatever those are. Uh, so it's about acting, it's about thinking, and it's about feeling in ways that are praiseworthy. That is, that bring honor to God. But where can we find the strength to carry out what we know to be right and good? And, and that's where the Scripture's power comes into play because it is God's living and active Word. Uh, the Bible doesn't just tell us what to do. It also empowers us to believe and to live in ways that bring God's blessing and approval. So if we unpack that concept, uh, and look at some examples of uh, the power of God's Word in its various forms, and then look at the implications that has for uh, ethical decision-making, I think it will help us better appreciate what we're talking about. So, uh, as we uh, seek to demonstrate the power of Scripture, we begin looking first at the power of God's Word where? Over creation itself. The power of His Word over creation itself. Uh, and then you look at the power of His prophetic Word, the power, His power on the preaching of the Word. And uh, so we look first in the power of God's written Word, or lastly, at God's written Word and the Scripture. So look first at the power of God's Word over creation. Uh, that's easily, most easily uh, uh, seen or, or, or found in something like Genesis chapter 1, where we're told that God spoke the world into existence. He spoke the world into existence. And throughout the uh, entire chapter, everything God does in Genesis 1, He does how? By speech. He just speaks. Wow, pretty cool. <laughs> he just speaks and it happens. And by his spoken word, he creates, he orders, he fills the universe. Not by using a hammer and a chisel or a saw. Or whatever. He just speaks <laughs> and it happens. In Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. So uh, his declaration, just the mere declaration, his speech, had, uh, had power so much so that his word brought everything into existence. Uh, it's not that those words have some power in themselves and God takes the words and uses them, but God uses his declaration as declarations as vessels that transmit His own power. Uh, his words are the means He uses to accomplish His ends. Much as any human being might use a hammer to drive a nail into place, God's words do the same thing. 
Uh, in second place, Scripture also makes it clear that God's Word has power when it comes through the mouths of prophets, his inspired prophets. So he, he speaks, and then he speaks through people. He speaks words, he speaks words through people. Isaiah 55, As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So uh, this talks about the speech of God coming out through his mouth. It's obvious he's referring to the speech that comes out of his mouth that then goes through his prophet Isaiah. It's now being channeled through Isaiah. And the people of Judah heard the word of the Lord, not from God's mouth directly, but through Isaiah. And even though it is mediated through Isaiah, a prophet, it has the same power it had when it came out of his mouth. And that's very important to remember uh, that uh, because some people don't understand that the Bible is the Word of God because they'll say, how can a transcendent God, you know, speak through human language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, but the Bible says there's no problem here <laughs> that God spoke created the worlds. God speaks to his prophets and the words of the prophet become the words of God. There's no difference. There's no diminution of those words. They're the same. Uh, the message is still powerful when Isaiah spoke it or when he wrote it because it was God's word from, to begin with. And a third way we see the power of God is through the uninspired preaching of the word of the gospel. That's people like me and other people when we preach the gospel. Uh, <clears throat> whether we know it or not, it has power. Preaching the word has power. Uh, that, that sometimes you'll hear people who are going to preach and say, "God, don't let me get in the way of your message." Okay, and what they mean by that is that ultimately the message that God has has power, although I might clutter it up. <laughs> I might be more confusing than I need to be, but somewhere in there, the message still gets through, and it's the powerful Word of God. And the New Testament confirms that when it says that God works through the preaching of the Gospel. Uh, <clears throat> and though I am not infallibly inspired, although I wish I were, I'm not infallibly inspired. Uh, the message of the gospel is infallible. Okay, The message of the gospel is infallible. So in Romans 1, Paul says, I'm so eager to preach the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And that idea there is the message of the gospel, the gospel message. And that's not just a statement of facts about Jesus. Uh, it's not. That's not what he's talking about. Uh, he, he's talking about the actual gospel message itself, the message of the gospel itself, and that's what he uses to bring people uh, to faith. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God unto salvation. So. That's what he's talking about there, the preaching of the cross. So sometimes when you're preaching, I don't know, do y'all preach? You preach, right? You preach, don't you? He preaches. You don't. Okay. Okay. Well, you need to preach. Anyway, everybody needs to preach. Anyway, sometimes when you're sometimes when you're preaching, you know, you're thinking like, boy, this is really this is like a lead balloon, right? You're like, well, this is going nowhere, right? You never felt that way? Well, I feel that way every Sunday. Anyway, uh, I always feel like it's going nowhere. And uh, and anyway, uh, but then I have to remind myself that it really isn't. It really isn't important what I think or how I feel about how well it's going, right? That as long as the gospel message is being declared, that has power. And that's why sometimes I'll spend 30 or 40 hours on a sermon and nobody says anything. And then I spend 15 hours on a sermon, and people, that was the best sermon I ever heard you preach. Really? <laughs> okay. Uh, because they heard more of the gospel in that one. Right? I mean, you think like, wow, maybe they heard more of the gospel in that one than the other one. I got it all cluttered up. Imagine when, what would happen if you just spent 15 minutes. Uh, well, I'd probably get fired. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'd get, I'd get fired, buddy, for uh, no doubt about that. Uh, yeah, so anyway, 
Uh, so notice again that Paul was speaking about the message itself, not just about the historical facts related to the message. Uh, in practice, people don't accept the truth of the gospel's claims uh, while at the same time condemning God as foolish for saving humanity. Okay? People count the gospel message as foolish because they don't believe that it's true. Acts 17, they laughed, they scoffed at Paul. Most of them did. A few believed, but most didn't uh, because it sounded absurd. It sounds like a, some sort of fanciful tale. Maybe he's just pulling one over on us. He's lying to us. Maybe he wants money from us. Who knows? Uh, and they think no right person would possibly believe it. And it's that reason that's for that reason the gospel seems like foolishness to unbelievers. But to people who believe, the preaching of the message of the gospel is powerful because it's the means by which God brings them to a saving knowledge of Himself and even reassures them through the preaching of the gospel that it is true and that it has a power. Uh, you remember. Uh, now we have we can't we we have to we have to really emphasize this because if we don't we substitute the the uh, the intellig the, the the intellectual somehow in place of the message so you have to become clever see see a lot of preachers e emphasize cleverness and in the process the gospel just gets lost somewhere in the whole thing and. Uh, and so, because we start to believe that it doesn't really have the power that the scriptures tell us it has, and uh, which of course is exactly what Satan wants us to believe. But uh, but you remember in Luke 16, you remember the story, uh, the rich man. In Luke 16, he looks up from hell and sees Lazarus being comforted by Abraham. And the rich man is afraid that his family is going to end up where he is. And he asks Abraham to raise Lazarus from the dead and send Lazarus to his family to preach repentance. And in Luke 16, what is, what is uh, Abraham recorded as saying? He says, they have Moses and the prophets. This is really pretty powerful. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. Now think about that. Now I don't think you believe that, do you? If you went today to the mortuary and they pulled a body out of the cooler and he all of a sudden opened his eyes, got up and walked out, that'd be far more impressive, wouldn't it? You see, that, that's what he's saying. Even if somebody got out of the mortuary, even if they walked from the dead, If they won't believe the written speech of God through the prophets, that won't convince them either. It's true. Hmm. So uh, there are at least a couple of things there that are important to what we're talking about relative to the power of the word and ethics. And the first is that Abraham was talking about what? He wasn't talking about a voice from Mount Sinai. He was talking about the words of the prophets that were written down. So he's talking about written words. They, written words, okay? If they won't believe the written words, even if someone rose from the dead, they wouldn't believe it. That's how, that's, this is interesting what he's pointing out to us here. That uh, the Moses and the prophets, they weren't alive, but they were authors who had written what they spoke, which they received from God. That was God's written word. And just as the words of Moses and the prophets were powerful when he inspired them originally, they continued to be powerful in written form. That's what you have is the written word of God, the words of Moses and the prophets, the apostle Paul and others. That's what you have. God's not using resurrected dead people to, to spread the message of the gospel. Why? Because they wouldn't believe that either. You believe that? They always have an explanation for it. So, secondly, there, Abraham said that the written words of Scripture written by God's prophets have as much power to bring people to repentance as some miraculous occurrence would have. So when you preach the gospel message, remember, it has power that even the rising of a dead person wouldn't even have. That's the kind of power that's available in that word, in that speech. Uh, that's the power of the Bible. 
And we realized that witnessing someone rise from the dead would be a pretty influential experience. It would potentially have life transforming power, but Jesus is saying that reading the Bible has even more power than witnessing the resurrection of a dead person. And Paul says the same thing when he writes in 2 Timothy, the Holy Scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The Scriptures, the graphe, the writings have that power to do this for you. So, uh, <clears throat> so the implication then relative to the power of God, the power of the Word of God in creation and, and prophetic speech, fallible preaching in the Bible, is that we are in a position to reflect on the implications they have for making ethical decisions, okay? The implications they have for making ethical decisions. Because, see, the tendency, the tendency in today's world is to go, the Bible, sh the Bible won't be enough. We need a little bit more than that. And what we're being told here is that, wait a minute, the Scriptures are sufficient. They are powerful. Don't ever forget that. If you do, then you'll be running around looking for all sorts of different ways to make sense of the world. When God said, here, I'll make sense of it for you. I'll give you my, my word, my speech. Power, one passage that touches on the practical implications of the power of God's word is Hebrews 4, where we read, the word of God is living and active. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. So what does the Word of God do in ethics, in the area of ethics, as this text says, it judges the heart. The Word of God judges the heart. Uh, it penetrates and evaluates our thoughts and motives. This is what the Word does. And it has the power to save us from condemnation and enable us to live moral lives. And if you look at what Paul says in 2 Timothy, that we've already read once before, maybe more than once, when he says the Holy Scriptures are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on and says, all Scripture is God-breathed. In other words, these Scriptures that are able to make you wise into salvation through faith in Jesus are, oh, by the way, inspired by God. They are His voice, if you will, being spoken through the writers of Scripture. And they are good for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped unto every good work. So, the Bible's power isn't reduced to simply that which leads us to faith in Christ initially, but as His voice, it has the power to equip us for every good work, which means making every decision a decision worthy of Him. And the Spirit uses the Bible, the Scriptures, to give us faith and wisdom to mold your character in ways that when you're confronted by moral choices, which you are all the time, you're able to choose the good and refuse the bad. Uh, and so many times, uh, most many Christians, none of you of course, but many Christians uh, are frustrated by their attempts to live ethical lives. They're frustrated in their attempt to live an ethical life. Many Christians often feel helpless or powerless, impotent to choose the right or the good. And it seems to me that in those moments when we feel impotent or unable to do that, uh, that we are reminded of the great encouragement, knowing what the Scriptures really are, uh, to meditate on the Scriptures, to Fill your mind with the Word of God. To meditate on it means to chew on it. Like, you know, a cow has how many stomachs? Three? Four. Four? Four. I know they had more than one. And so they just take the cud and they just pass it from one chamber to the next chamber to the next chamber. I don't know what happens in that last chamber, but whatever. They produce milk. Anyway... Uh, and other stuff. But anyway, so, so when you meditate on the Bible, you're like the cow remasticating the, the cud over and over and over and over again uh, until, until it becomes really a part of you, a part of you. And that I don't mean that you're able to sort of quote scripture verses to people like that. that like, that's not what we mean at all. Uh, but rather, it creates a world that you occupy. 
It's a world you live in now. And that world is infused with God's presence and His power, His love, uh, His presence with you. That word saturates you with an awareness of those things, not just with a few verses here or there, but just a sort of a sense of being in His presence through His Word. And that creates the world that He wants you to live in, the world that's His world, the world that He owns and that He occupies. And so it empowers us to live for God. And so as you look, constantly are learning about the Bible and reading and meditating on the Bible, uh, it brings you closer and closer into contact with the power of God. And uh, that is the way He accomplishes His purposes through His people. And so the power of the Scriptures is really vastly important for Christian ethical living. I mean, you've got to have that. Uh, it's just uh, it's it's essential if we're going to be able to do what we're being called here to do. So it's not only powerful; it's authoritative. It has authority, and so the second attribute of the Bible uh, that derives from its inspiration is its authority. And so it's seven o'clock, and we need to take a break because Artis is getting a sore throat. <laughs>